30. Committee room 30. Uh, public session then, and welcome the members in the room. We have uh, uh, Mike Nesbitt here, we have Trevor Lunn, we have Martina Anderson and myself as chair, and we have Marie and Craig from the officials, and I know that we have got Pat uh, via teleconferencing at this stage in terms of members. So as usual, uh, the committee meeting is being recorded and broadcast as well. And also just ask people to keep a wee eye on their mobile devices should it start to interrupt with any of the any of the uh, microphones. So um, the apologies we had received an apology from from George Robinson, but I think he's trying his best to join us by uh, by phone. So hopefully he'll come in there. But if not, we can record him as an apology. Um, item two is the draft minutes, which are on page five of the meeting. Are members content that it's a uh, True reflection of the proceedings? Yep. Content. Okay, so you can sign that up. Um, and then any matters arising for, as item three on the agenda? Nope. Okay, that's fine. Well, then that moves us on then to uh, item four, which is the budget 2020 uh, 2021. Um, and we have received a departmental written briefing on the budget. So, um, at the meeting on the 25th of March, we agreed to adopt the standardised approach for um, approaching the budget this year in terms of scrutiny, uh, and that there was a template that was provided by the Committee of Finance, which we then forwarded to the department and asked them to complete. So, on page 11 of the meeting papers, um, the department has completed that template, and um, they have also commented that an allocation hasn't been provided for victims payments so maybe at this stage i could refer members to page three of the table papers which is a response from the minister of state at the northern ireland office in relation to the development and introduction of the legislation to address the legacy issues so essentially there isn't any allocation in the departmental budget but the letter which was a response to ourselves from the minister of state is indicating that they're still consulting and still working that through so there's been no determination that's taken as to where that budget's going to come from yet um, there is also a uh, raised briefing paper on Assembly Committee Coordinated Budget Scrutiny, which is on at page 5 of the table papers, and it includes some scrutiny points that members might want to consider when we question in a minute the, the officials. Um, there is also two pieces of correspondence which has been forwarded by the Committee for Finance regarding funding that is in relation to the COVID-19, and it is on pages 39 and 41 of the table papers and are all relevant to the presentation that we will be about to get. Also, we had received um, a copy of written evidence from Dr Esmond Burney, from, uh, which was given to the House of Commons Northern Ireland Affairs Committee regarding the New Decade New Approach Agreement, and it is on page 174 of the meeting papers under correspondence. So uh, all of that uh, is relevant to the presentation and, and the oral briefing that we're about to get. Hopefully, at this stage, then we should have uh, Peter. We do uh, know is online. Is Mark Brown arrived yet? Uh, yes, Chair, I'm here. Excellent, Mark. You're very welcome. Um, maybe, and we just will do um, Mark. If yourself and Peter are there, um, we'll do first of all a quick introduction of the members that are in the room. Uh, and then we'll double check who is online with yourself there as well. So um, I'm, I'm here myself, Colin McGrath as chair. Mike Nesbitt as uh, deputy chair. Uh, Trevor Lung. Martina Anderson, Sinn Féin MLA for Derry. Okay, and do we have any other members online? I know that we have Pat online. Is there any other members on there? Pat Sheehan, is there online anybody else? No. Okay, so um, Mark, uh, yourself and Peter, just re to remember, this is also being recorded um, by Hansard as well. And we can just welcome Christopher Stalford into the room. You're very Hello. welcome, Christopher. Hi. We're just about to start the presentation on the budget. So, Brilliant. Mark, can we pass over to yourselves to give us a quick update and then we can move to members for questions? Certainly, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, I hope the technology works for all of us. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to provide briefing on TEO's budgetary requirements for the 2020-21 uh, financial year. 
Part A of the committee's template requested information regarding budgetary adjustments in 2019-20. Um, well, TEO received additional resource Dell budget of £0.9 million in the January monitoring round to take forward work in relation to HIA implementation, uh, COSICA, uh, the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional uh, 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 Abuse, uh, and the Troubled Permanent Disabled Disablement Payment Scheme, sometimes known as uh, uh, Victims Payments. And during 1920, uh, TEO surrendered resource Dell funding of 0.4 million in relation to EU exit, as this was ring fenced and couldn't be used for other purposes. Capital Dell funding of approximately 7.6 million uh, was also surrendered across the department's capital programs due to issues such as delays in contractor procurement uh, and site surveys. In terms of the department's uh, AME budgets, members will be aware that TEO established provisions for HIA implementation and victims' payments, which were reflected in the 2019-20 uh, spring supplementary estimates. These new prov provisions resulted an increase of 537.4 million in the department's net resource requirement. Part B of the committee's template requested information on TEO's budgetary requirements for 2021. Our latest assessment is that TEO's resource Dell budgetary requirement amounts to 184.6 million pounds, of which 151.1 million is inescapable, 33 million is pre-committed, and half a million is high priority. Inescapable expenditure primarily comprises staff costs in the department and its arms length bodies, together with the legislative obligations relating to historical institutional abuse implementation and uh, victims' payments. Also included is contractually committed expenditure on staffing and projects within the Social Investment Fund and Communities in Transition. In terms of current challenges, uh, TEO is taking forward the delivery of key functions that support the executive's response to COVID-19, including operational responsibility for the NI hub and leading on the delivery of an advertising and public information campaign. The department's uh, capital Dell budgetary requirements amount to 18.8 million in 2021, of which 10.1 million relates to contractual commitments within the SIF and Urban Village programmes. The department is entitled to retain 10% of FTC repayments to set against these pressures, and that amounts to 0.7 million. TEO <coughs> pardon me, also anticipates receiving income of some five million pounds in 2021, the majority of which represents the recruit recruitment of existing costs. This is therefore acquired in order to meet the department's RDL pressures. The TEO's proposed budget for 2021 does not include allocations for victims' payments themselves uh, and for various elements of NDNA. At this stage, we are taking forward the necessary preparatory work for these matters within the department's baseline on the basis that additional funding for full implementation will be made available at the appropriate time. The June monitoring round will enable the department to bid for its COVID-19 costs and also to receive Communities in Transition funding from DOJ. This is a challenging time for us all, um, an uncertain time, and we'll be keeping the budgetary position of the department under close scrutiny over the coming weeks uh, and months. I hope that overview has been helpful, and Peter and I would be happy to take questions from members on any of the issues uh, raised. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mark, for that. Um, we'll move on then to members' questions, and I'll start off myself with a few. Um, you mentioned there and referenced the uh, separate budget allocation that will be required for the COVID-19 response, um, and, and I know that that has been sort of separate from the rest of the budgets that you have, um, but uh, are you sort of confident that you will get the right amount of money that you need to be able to deliver the response and certainly as you progress that that response is that being costed and then delivered or delivered and then sort of costed well the 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 position is that the um the uh minister of finance um in looking at the available allocations for COVID 19 coming across from through the barnet consequentials 
um, brought a paper to the executive which recommended basically that the bulk of that money, if not all of it, should go to the health response. Uh, and that was supported by the executive. Um, so uh, uh, the initial costs that we would have in relation to the hub are not at presently at present being met because um, all the money has gone to to to, to health uh, or, or, or other very urgent pressures. Um, but we would intend to bid at the first monitoring round, and I would be hopeful uh, that, in light of the fact there have been some further Barnett consequences, that some of that might be met. But that will depend very much, Chair, on just how this whole crisis develops. In the meantime, we feel we can absorb the initial costs uh, in the short term that we're being asked to, to absorb, but in the longer term, we would want to, we will be bidding, and we'd be hopeful, uh, or we would need to um, um, receive some additional funding. And could you give us a, an update on just what those hubs are? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think of a fair idea what they are, but just what exactly is that two million pounds been spent on? What what do the hubs? Is that the the hubs that are based out in amongst the councils, or are you funding those, or is that a separate type of hub? Or well, the the, the current emergency management arrangements are that each department has has um, a, a DOC, a, a, D, a departmental uh, operational centre. Um, to coordinate its response, uh, but what what we are funding in TEO is the central hub, the what's called the Northern Ireland hub, um, which provides as I mean it it, it 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 draws in information from all the departmental hubs, uh, along with information from councils and from a range of other sources, including the PSNI and so forth, all the various relevant agencies, uh, and then provides a situation report to the executive and provides the various information that the executive uh, requires and, and that the first and deputy first minister require in order to be able to take the decisions they need to take in managing the overall crisis. So really, uh, the New Ireland hub is, is, is the central hub, if you like, uh, and there are other hubs out in, in uh, individual departments, but the funding that we need is for the central hub. Okay. And look, I mean, in terms of the COVID-19, um, looking at it across the whole of its, its rates, um, it's taken everybody, obviously, in, in some decision-making processes out of their comfort zone, um, and that's to be expected because responses need to be taken very quickly. Now, still involved in that, you know, can we examine just the communication between the department, maybe, and ourselves as a committee? Because um, if we take, the, the, for example, the, the regulations, um, you know, they were implemented at the end of March, the sort of approval was given by the Assembly on the 21st of April, and as a committee, we're looking at it on the 22nd of April. Now, that's completely reverse of the way that it should be. It, it should really be the committee looks at it, then it goes to the Assembly, and then the department gets to make its response. You know, so is there some way that we could examine how we might better keep uh, up to date with that? Because... As I say, nobody's questioning that the, the decisions need to be taken, but it just seems very uncomfortable that we're going about it back to front. Um, I think, Chair, that's something I would, I would have to take to the, uh, the, the, the head of the hub to ask just what the arrangements are around that. I think uh, I'm not over the detail of that, um, but I think that, that that is probably a consequence of just the necessary pace at which events have to move. Um, and, and the, the, the need for speedy decisions, but certainly that's something I can I can I can relay back uh, to to the hub. And if the committee wants to write to me on that, I can certainly get get some uh, input uh, from from the head of the hub on that matter. Okay, we, we, we'll do that. And again, just to clarify, Mark, that's certainly not a criticism. I, I really appreciate that it is because of the. The, the, the scenario, but I suppose that because it's a scenario that we, we obviously haven't planned for and we're, we're working our way through, it's about is there a real-time way of being able to examine, can we change anything on the go to make sure that that, that um, sort of democratic scrutiny is in place because we don't want to find out afterwards that things could have been done differently uh, and that if they were done differently they could have been done better. You know, It's just to be able to keep ourselves up to date with that. And then if I, if I could ask you finally, it does say um, that you've identified inex, inescapable pressures of 6.3 million uh, for staff resources in relation to the exit from the EU. Just two matters there. Number one, um, can you elaborate maybe on what that staffing cover is? And then just would you have any comment on 
how where we are in terms of the work. I know it's not your direct responsibility, but maybe just from an observation from being a director in the department, given that you know the, the British government seems hell bent on, on continuing with Brexit, but that gives us about six or eight weeks before we need to have everything in place and we're in the middle of a uh, you know, a, a crisis that needs responded to. If, uh, could you tell us about those staff <coughs> pressures and, and where the department is with Brexit? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let Peter pick up on the actual the financial element of that, Chair, if that's okay. Uh, maybe on the more general question, um, the, it is important that, that the voice of Northern Ireland is represented uh, in the discussions, the ongoing discussions uh, around Brexit, and obviously the first and Dep deputy first minister um, are, are um, participating uh, in that. Um, so there is a need, despite the fact that Brexit was once the all-consuming uh, number one priority, now that's been replaced by COVID-19, but it nevertheless remains a very, very important um, um, issue. Uh, and it's, it's, it's one that the department needs to uh, be supporting ministers, be in touch with uh, Whitehall and the other devolved administrations uh, in order to ensure that it's managed in an effective way. So we continue to have an important role in that, uh, and I'll say that does bring with it various costs. But perhaps Peter could pick up on the on the detail of the the, the finances around that. Peter. Yeah, the the. Uh Cost that we've outlined in the template, uh, the 2.7, reflects, I suppose, the our, our assessment of what would be required uh, even before uh, COVID-19. That was the assessment of the staffing-related costs, uh, which make up the bulk of that uh, allocation. Uh, approximately £2 million pounds of that is in relation to the team mm -hmm. that is in place. Uh, but we also have uh, requirements in relation to uh, media commitments that were planned as we move throughout the transition period, uh, and also in relation to any sort of, I suppose, the administrative travelling requirements to and from uh, London, etc. So that reflects our assessment at this stage. Uh, it was put in place before uh, the current circumstances we find ourselves in, uh, and will remain un under close scrutiny. I have to say, it is. Uh, provided that funding is provided by DOF separately uh, as a ring fenced budget. So if that budget is either insufficient or indeed not required, we liaise directly with DOF on that. And uh, the, the requirements in relation to uh, uh, Brexit are dealt with centrally with DOF and in conjunction with other departments. Okay, I think it, maybe you, you might elaborate for us on the media element of that. What what would you mean by media commitments in terms of of, of Brexit the, uh, as exiting? Is that information updates or? It would be. It would be. I suppose engaging with the public around uh, any implications or or what what's happening, just so that the public are aware of what's happening and and uh, what's required. But again. Um, that 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 was put in by the Brexit team as something that would be uh, helpful and necessary to address what would be undoubtedly a change uh, in uh, the way things are done uh, in relation to Brexit. Okay, thank you. I'll pass on to Mike then. Chair, thank you, Mark and, and Peter. Good afternoon. Um, I I have I think th three areas I'd like to look at: two specifics and one more general. Um, I think for members' benefits, I'll give out the page number relevant to the, the information pack, but for Mark and Peter, then also the page number of the briefing document that they supplied us. So starting on pack page 21, which is page 11 uh, of the departmental briefing, um, at the top, the first line is about costs for programme delivery for new decade, new approach. Uh, and there's 0.8 of a million pounds, or 800,000 pounds, for preparatory work on language, identity, and cultural expression, including progressing legislation and the creation of the relevant bodies. Does that mean that the 5.8 million pound budget line for the Office of Culture that you had previously presented to us has gone in the meantime? Well, uh Mike, what we're doing at the moment um, is doing preparatory work within the department around the policy and around the preparation uh, for the bill and for taking the bill through the assembly. Uh, as we discussed before around uh, potential costs 
around uh, the office and indeed the other the, the commissioner posts, those haven't been determined uh, in detail. Uh, all we had done before was to put in a general marker bid to identify that there would be some costs required. Um, so until, we, until we're clear about um, the timing of the legislation, which, which obviously is, is um, particularly challenging in the current circumstances, uh, we'll not know what the spend is going to be required this year. Uh, and I think our current plan is that um, what is likely to happen is that there will, there will be work done to, to develop the legislation, uh, develop the outline of the office, appoint uh, um, some of the people in the office and ask them then to specify what they feel the requirements are for those offices uh, and then for that to be considered by uh, ministers in terms of the overall costs. So it's a combination of, of a slightly different approach uh, and of the fact that um, the timescale has necessarily had to change because of the current, uh, emergency. Yeah, I, I absolutely understand the circumstances have changed, Mark. I'm going to take that as a yes, that 5.8 budget line has gone in the meantime, but without prejudice to a budget line being brought in later on in the financial year, depending on how things roll out. I think the likelihood is that by the time legislation would go through, allowing for the circumstances, and by the time any appointment processes would be in place, the likelihood of significant expenditure this year is fairly small. Okay, thank you. The second point, which is actually the next line on the same page, I see there's half a million for new posts to address a range of essential departmental functions, which I understand. You've got a 72.4% increase uh, in your departmental expenditure limits. Your budget's way, way up. But it just makes me wonder, Mark, um, given the voluntary exit scheme was the biggest reduction in headcount in the history of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, has that impacted negatively with hindsight because of Brexit and now COVID-19? Well, um, I, I think the, the purpose of the voluntary exit scheme at the time, as you probably recall, was to reduce the budget uh, payable um, because of budgetary pressures that were on departments at that point. And there was a very significant reduction, as you say, through the voluntary exit scheme in order to reduce the cost of civil servants, and it, just, it, it uh, resulted in a fairly significant uh, reduction in the numbers of civil servants. Um, and there's no doubt that at, at that point, no one had um, predicted that there would be uh, significant new uh, issues such as Brexit and um, COVID-19 coming into play. Um, so uh, there's no doubt that that has put pressure then on the uh, resources, and there has been a need then to scale back up again. Uh, and finally, and I think this is maybe more complex, certainly in my own mind, uh, and this is page 16 of the members' pack, but page 6 uh, of the briefing pack, um, annual managed uh, expenditure. Um, now, I remember at Stormont House Talks, uh, the then head of the civil service had the parties briefed on the difference between the block grant, which is a fixed sum of money which the executive carves up as it wishes, into DELs, into DELs for the various departments. That's one source of money. Amy is a second flexible sum of money, which we were told to think of as paying for pensions, benefits, uh, and student loans primarily. But I see here you have made an allocation in 1920 of 434 million of Amy uh, for redress payments for abuse victims. 105 million uh, for troubles victims, uh, and then a smaller amount for holiday pay entitlement. <clears throat> Could either Mark or Peter talk me through how that works? Well, I think in the, in the first instance, Mike, I'll kick off, but this is really an accounting issue, so Peter will give you the detail uh, of it. I mean, you're quite right that the sorts of things Amy is usually used for are those things that you have just described, like uh, Social Security expenditure or, or student-related uh, uh, costs. And there are things where the expenditure is unpredictable uh, and is largely uh, demand-led. But there are also circumstances where there are um, liabilities that are going to come into play that are unclear, uh, where you create a provision. And in creating a provision, you have to look at uh, ensuring there's appropriate uh, financial provision made. And I understand that to be Amy. But Peter will give you the chapter and verse on that, Peter. So the way it works uh, is... Um, because of the, 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 the nature of those two schemes at the moment, in, in, in accounting terms, in our accounts, we have to create a provision for them. And a provision 
it's a liability uh, which is uncertain in terms of either timing or amount. Um, and whenever we do that, uh, create that provision uh, in the accounts, then public expenditure rules dictate that we must make a corresponding adjustment in the budgets because public expenditure is a, a consideration of accounts, of budgets, and of estimates. So there's a three pronged uh, assessment. So whenever we trigger something in accounts, we have to do a corresponding entry in our budgets. And the consolidated budgeting guidance, which is our, I suppose, handbook as to how we treat those matters, it dictates that when you create a provision in the accounts, you create a corresponding entry in the AME budget. So by us doing that, it's simply following uh, stated guidance that that's what we do. Now, a provision, uh, because it's uncertain, because we don't know when it's going to happen, uh, we, we recognize it in AMI. Whenever we start to use that provision, so as and when payments start to happen, for example, in relation to HIA, then we need the appropriate budget cover in our Dell budgets. And then you'll see this year that we did get the $37.5 million in our Dell allocation because as and when we start to make payments, that hits our Dell budget and the AME cover reduces accordingly. So it is unusual. It's not like normal accounting, uh, public sector accounting, but it, it's, it's really just a reflection of the rules that we have to follow. The way I would characterize it as a non-accountant is that this is almost flagging up at an early point the total bill is to come. Uh, and then when you get to Dell, it's a, you're actually making the payment. So the AMI is sort of flagging up the total cost that might that you might be likely to incur over the whole period. Is that right, Peter? Yep. Yes, I, I get that. I think it's just important that, that uh, victims of historical abuse understand that that AMI sum of £434 million pounds does not exist as an actual sum of money, but it is the anticipated cost over the lifetime of the scheme. Whereas, as you said, Peter, uh, and this is on page 20 or page 10 of the, the, the briefing, there is actually this year £37.5 million pounds of actual money for redress. That's correct. Okay. Now, Peter, you mentioned the consolidated budgeting guidance. And I've had a look at that. And can you just clarify for me at 1.43 under restrictions and switches, it says departments may not switch provision from Amy to Dell. That's correct. So what, what actually happens uh, in relation to whenever we, it's not an actual switch from Amy to Dell that happens. What actually happens is there's a, a reduction. We, we, we process reduction through the Amy budget and we reduce that. Right. And we make a corresponding, and then the corresponding cost comes through in the Dell. So we're not actually switching budgets per se. Um, it's, it's, the, uh, it's how it actually works. Actually, if it's in section 3.65 of consolidated budgeting gives you how, those, how the, the provision works and what the scoring uh, actually happens in relation to that. There's a helpful table there that, that will explain that where it shows you about the recognizing the provision then. <coughs> Okay, that's it. Thanks, Peter. I'll look at that. So you're yeah. saying basically at the end of this financial year, if you spend the 37.5 million of Dell on redress, that the 434 4 million of Amy comes down by 37 and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because, because we've utilised that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I say there's 105 million of Amy over the first three years of the scheme of the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme which we've previously known as the Troubles uh, Pension. But also on page 20 stroke 10, uh, in terms of Dell, there's 56.3 million allocated. But in this case, does that money actually exist? Well, I, I think the, 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 it's the same process as Peter just described with one difference. Uh, what we're identifying is the fact that uh, if the, the scheme goes ahead as planned, uh, with the timing, there could be the possibility of spending 56 million, uh, and therefore we need to have that money um, um, available. Um, now, it hasn't been put into our budget because, as you'll be aware, uh, the executive takes the view uh, that this should be funded from 
the British Treasury, um, and that that funding should, should 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 come in that way. That funding hadn't been provided. Um, the uh, the the permanent secretary of the Department of Finance did did write asking uh, about the funding and hasn't yet received any substantive reply from the NIO. So this is a matter that's still under discussion and debate between uh, the executive and our Department of Finance and the Treasury. From our perspective as a department, uh, in order to actually make those victims' payments, we would need that budget because that budget has not been made available to us. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to be clear, Margaret, on behalf of victims. If you're a victim of historical institutional abuse, there is £37.5 million available in this financial year to start progressing redress payments. <coughs> yeah. That's correct, and there's also a redress board in place, a president in place, and an application process that is opened and operating, as you know. Yeah, but uh, if, at, if you're a victim of the troubles and you want to apply for the permanent disability pay scheme, there is no budget at the moment. There's, there's, we, we have identified what we think the cost would be. Those costs have not been made available to us, but the two schemes are at different uh, uh, points in development. Um, the, the arrangements uh, uh, for for victims uh, to apply for the permanent disabled scheme and all the arrangements for payments and so forth are not yet in place. But the money is not in place. But the 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 the, um, the arrangements would need to be in place because it's the arrangements and the applications that generate the need for the funding. We have identified if they went forward according to the original time frame, that's the cost that we would or the, the budget we would need. And as I say, there's a bit of a a. a uh, uh, debate around that between um, the executive and the treasury. I'm just trying but to be clear, Mark. The money, the money for the abuse victims of historical abuse, that money is agreed by the executive and will be made available. But the same cannot be said for the troubles victims' money. Well, I think what what I'm saying is that on the historic institutional abuse, the arrangements are in place, the application process is in place, the arrangement to decide that and to make awards are all in place. Application, it's open the application, and therefore those payments will start to come through, and the money for that is therefore in place. In relation to the the, uh, the permanent disabled scheme, we're not at that stage because the arrangements are not in place. The designated department hasn't been agreed, uh, and therefore there's no there's no mechanism at the moment to apply and, and therefore to be awarded. But it's not. That's uh, not what I'm uh, asking. I'm asking whether the budget is there. And you're saying the executive think the NIO should provide the budget, and the NIO are not saying yes. The budget is, is, is not yet in place, it's correct, but nor are the arrangements to actually draw down the budget in place. Yeah, well, that, I would look on that as a technical thing, whereas I think the bigger issue is the political disagreement about where the money's coming from. And I think victims who are looking forward to applying for this payment should be aware that they're not in the same place as the victims of historical institutional abuse. But I, I will leave it there, Chair. Okay, uh, Martina. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for that briefing and overview. Um, I just want to just pass comment more on what the, the Chair has said and support our need as a committee uh, to exercise the, uh, the process of scrutiny because it's not good enough as a committee that we're going to be doing this retrospectively. And therefore, I think as a committee, as members, we're more than willing uh, to, to do that at, at a, per, a particular time of the, the day or night, if necessary, in order to allow the scrutiny to take place. So I think whether it's template design and to agree uh, with the department and with the committee how that needs to be done, we need to find a mechanism so, because I'm, I'm very much aware that the pace of the way things have to move forward in COVID-19, um, but we are all willing to, uh, to operate outside of the norms of in terms of time. And I just want you to know that I think in terms of committee, we would be available uh, so that that doesn't be um, a prohibitor in future from having us to retrospectively carry out a function of scrutiny when the decisions are already been taken. Can I ask you in relation to the um, 0.4 million on page six that you talk about the EU exit and part of that was for preparation in the event of a no deal. Now, uh, some might say uh, bring back Brexit, all is forgiven uh, from where we're at at the moment. Um, but I would like to hear more information with regards to what kind of preparation had been underway 
because many in society uh, would be would have been concerned and still are about the prospects of a no deal we're still potentially facing into that situation there's negotiations underway so i'm i'm still concerned that uh, that that work that maybe have started has it been stopped and where are we uh, with regards to an assessment um, of a potential no deal Brexit. I'll go through a few questions, so maybe rather than bouncing in and out. Um, okay. I also, on page, uh, page 7 and then on page 10, there's reference to Ebrington and work underway in Ebrington um, in, in Derry, and the site there, and there's capital requirements 2.3 million, and there's uh, there's to the, the both of them, the both reference, they have been described as non ring fence expenditure. Um, so I'm I'm a little bit concerned about the fact that they are described as non ring fenced, and want to know is there a guarantee that this funding will be fu fully utilised? And I'm very conscious of where we're at at the moment and the difficulties of utilising any funding, but I just want don't want anything to slide. Um, and then, now you've mentioned, you were talking there to Mike with regards to the historical institutional abuse. And I've been dealing with John McCourt uh, and others around the survivors, for instance, of the North West. And you said about, you know, there's, there's, there's now open for application. Now, this may not be your territory, but I know that, for instance, and we've raised this before, about the need for a birth certificate and a passport. And, and that has proven difficult uh, for for some of for some of the some of the victims. Most people, if you have a passport, you've had access to your birth certificate at one time or another. So I think that is viewed as being somewhat over bureaucratic, and they, that may not be your area of work. But perhaps when we get to the point uh, when when we're dealing with it later around the statutory rules uh, chair if you want me to come back to that because i have a couple of issues uh, around this that that we need to flag up so i just want to say to you that once the applications have opened uh, it's not uh, plain sailing and i think that there's some information that are needed by the survivors for instance the surviving spouses of children um, of applying on behalf of a deceased person um, are they entitled to an award of redress on the same basis as a living applicant, uh, meaning that the award to them, the, the spouse of the children, is not considered taxable um, or a benefit? And then there's, I suppose, there's the issue of what we're dealing with around COVID and the whole uh, coronavirus pandemic and COVID-19, because access to files uh, of those who give evidence to the historical institutional abuse inquiry in Banbridge. I know that some, and but not all, of the files have been transferred. And given where we're at at the moment, there ne that needs to be done in a digital uh, format. So I only raise this with you because you said, look, the application is open and perhaps I don't want to give the impression or to leave the impression that this is just now being processed in a way uh, that isn't resulting in some bureaucratic hurdles that victims have to overcome or attempt to. Okay, thanks, Martin. I'm happy to take those questions. Uh, I'm maybe start in reverse and pick up the HIA one first. It is my area. Um, you may recall Gareth and I uh, um, came to the committee to, to, to discuss this. Uh, the scheme has opened despite the fact that we're in the middle of the, of the COVID lockdown, and that was quite a significant uh, achievement. Uh, we've tried to keep it um, as digitally based as possible um, while also uh, providing for paper forms and paper applications for those who don't have access to the digital route. Uh, and all of that was designed to ensure that we, we, we um, uh, adhere to the, the current restrictions and the current guidance uh, on, on COVID so people aren't going to meet solicitors and so forth. So we've tried to keep it uh, um, online. We've had um, so far, <clears throat> let me see, we've had 21 applications have been received to date. Six of those are hard copy and 15 are uh, online. In terms of um, the point you made about those that went to heart uh, and were at the acknowledgement, um, uh, um, and those that weren't, there were eight came from the heart uh, inquiry and 15 were, were non-heart. Um, in respect of the processes, we, we worked through the processes with the victims groups to try and make them as user friendly as possible. But if there are some issues that are being identified, it's important that they're raised to 
uh, the interim advocate and raised to the redress board so they can be dealt with. In terms of uh, establishing identity, um, it's the same requirements as, as are required in order to vote. So if there are other sources of, of identity, I'm not sure it has to be a passport, if there are other ways of establishing your identity, it's the same requirement as, as, as it is in order to vote. So that should provide some scope there for people to establish. Can I just, um, just ask a question there, so I'm clear on this? So you're saying it's either or, because I believe the victims understand it's, for instance, a birth certificate is needed along with, in addition to, a passport. So not one or the other. So what you're saying, it's uh, a form of identification as opposed to all of that together? I, I, think, I think you need both, but you need a birth certificate and a form of identification which is consistent with what you need in order to vote. I don't think it has to be a passport. I think that's, that's what I'm saying, Martina, but I can get you chapter and verse on that. Well, it is just the difficulties for some of these victims. They don't have a birth certificate, and we've already gone through this, and we know that has been exposed. So yeah. that's where the bureaucratic process needs to be examined here, and you need to go back to what you're asking people to, to present when they Well, this, this was discussed, uh, and it was acknowledged that there may be some difficulties for some people with birth certificates, and were there sufficient evidence of, uh, of proof um, of both their, their identity and the fact that they were in a home. That's the, that's the critical thing and that's the purpose of that uh, material. So there, there are ways of doing that. Um, but as I say, we can, we can, we can pick that up. Okay. In terms of the spouses and ch ch children, um, my understanding is that it is on the same basis. It's non-taxable. Um, okay. that's, that's my, my understanding. But I, again, I can check through the detail of that okay. for you. Um, in respect of the files and prony, we have staff down there, and it is difficult because, once again, the restrictions are impacting on staff available to, to do this work. But the, the record in prony is being digitised, and good progress is being made on that, and has been made available to the uh, redress board. But as I just mentioned in those figures, we expect that there will be quite significant numbers of people who will come forward who will not have been to heart, uh, and whose, whose records won't already be in, in, in the public record office. But, but where they are, you know, we are digitising them and making them available to the uh, redress board. Okay, so they are being transferred in, in that digital format. Those that have not yet been done will be done? They're, it's all in progress. Uh, I haven't got the, the actual figures of where we were, but the last time I looked at it, we were, there was quite significant progress made. There's somewhere in the region of, of, of 500, I think, uh, just over 500 applications uh, in the public record office. Uh, and and uh, somewhere so, so, somewhere around 150 or so have been digitised, um, but we're working through those uh, on a, on a regular basis. I haven't got uh, uh, the current figures, but okay, I can you get. Give us an update there. because 150 out of 500 isn't really a substantive. Uh, you know, it's not the lion's share of it. Um, so maybe if you could give us an update as to where that's at. But I do think Martin is important to recognise that that um, in in opening the scheme, we did make the point that. There were going to be restrictions on our capacity to be able to make all the information available and to move applications through as quickly as we would expect under different under other circumstances without COVID, because we only have a limited number of people we can make available, or get get to uh, be available to do this work. So we're trying to progress it as, as best we can because we thought it was important to meet that commitment to uh, victims to actually open uh, uh, at the end of uh, March, as we said we would. Okay, and, I, and I do appreciate that this is unprecedented circumstances that we're in, and I know the PRONI is working on skeleton staff because of COVID, but you will appreciate in terms of our role as, as MLAs of needing to try to scrutinise and push this, uh, if we can get it moving forward a little bit faster. No, absolutely, and we're doing everything we can to keep it moving. PRONI is actually, in fact, closed. And it's only open uh, uh, to the extent that our staff are, are able, and the staff uh, in the court and tribunal service are actually able to access these uh, funds. Sorry, these, these, these records. Okay. Uh, turning to uh, Ebrington, uh, just to reassure you on Ebrington, um, the, although the money is not ring fenced, it's 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 uh, money that we bid for every year as part of our capital uh, uh, program. Um, we have not had a problem with the availability of capital. Um, generally, uh, um, w w where we have needed the money, the money's been there. Um, it takes time uh, getting the, the buildings there into a shape uh, they, you, you, where, they, where they can actually be leased out. Um, you run into all sorts of problems because they are ancient, there, there's an ancient monument uh, there in terms of Starfort Wall um, because they are older buildings. Um, we're also working with the, um, the private sector to um, make sure that there are leases, leases made available. 
Um, but good progress has been made right, right across the site, and there's now an agreement, either a license in place or an agreement for a license for all of the, uh, the buildings. So um, I just want to reassure you that there's no threat to the availability of funding at present uh, on Ebrington. Um, we're, we're, we're able to go forward uh, uh, on all, all the buildings on that. Mark, could I just say that uh, the, the terminology of ring fenced is one that is applied by DOF. So it's only ring fenced from a DOF perspective whenever we say that. Uh, when we say non ring fenced, that, that means it's within the discretion of us in the department to allocate uh, funding uh, according to where our priorities are. And as Marcus said, capital funding has been made available and has been allocated to Everington to complete the work that's been ongoing there. So the ring fence is, is a technical <coughs> term that, that is applied by DOF. Okay, that's helpful because I couldn't understand when it was said it was a pre-commitment and then saying it was non-ring fenced. I thought that was a contradiction, but I understand now what you're saying. It's just a technical term. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the other point about uh, um, no deal Brexit and, and the cost. I mean, I would have to defer to my Brexit colleagues on this because uh, I'm not involved in the detail of that. It seems to say that the team uh, had, had, had been operating to look at all eventualities uh, and had been um, keeping in touch with developments and, 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 and putting contingency rooms uh, uh, in place as far as possible. Uh, the planning on Brexit continues, and as I mentioned earlier on, the, the contact with the other DAs and with uh, the, uh, and with Westminster uh, uh, and with the EU continues in order to, to be able to understand what is being planned, what the potential impact is uh, locally. So we need to have that team still in place. But uh, the COVID-19 has, has really consumed so much uh, uh, time and space that, that the levels of activity are, are, are not as high as they were. It's just I'm concerned that you have funding being surrendered for a process that's still going on in terms of negotiations, mm -hmm. and we could be facing a no deal Brexit. So therefore, if you're surrendering funding that was dealing with that part of that preparation, then that's my concern that uh, even if you did have the wherewithal and the personnel to look at this, and I'm sure, because we have an executive Brexit committee uh, established as well. So that's why I'm raising it, because of the funding that had been surrendered in the in-year monitoring round. Yeah, they, they, but the funding there, there Martina, was, was surrendered because it wasn't required in that year. Uh, uh, if we need further funding, uh, you know, we, we will be seeking it from centrally from, from DOF. It doesn't mean we're not putting any money towards a no-deal Brexit or, or pre preparations. It simply means in, in the last year, the money was surrendered because we didn't require it in that time frame. Okay, well, it would be good at some stage to get an update as to where we're at with that. Yeah, I think if the committee wants to uh, uh, wants to write to the department, someone from the Brexit side could come and uh, um, present on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, and, and we've been told we're having a briefing next week on Brexit, yeah. so that's timely then that, to get that information. Yeah. Um, Christopher? Hi there, and thanks for your answers so far. In terms of, it's page 26 in my pack, it's Annex A. Um, the finance ministers have the view that the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme should be funded by the Treasury, and on that basis an allocation is not being provided at this stage. Can you give me an update on where the conversations are at with Treasury on that? Well, as I, as I, I think I mentioned in my earlier answer uh, some time ago, through Gray wrote to, to Jonathan Stevenson, uh, who's now retired, um, raising the issue about, about funding and the fact that since the policy originated, uh, in, in uh, West, Westminster, it should be funded uh, from there, and that was consistent with um, the, uh, the funding policy guidance. Uh, we didn't receive any substantive reply uh, to, to, to that, and in the recent budget, uh, when, the, when, the, when the initial allocations were being made, uh, Connor Murphy did make the point that, in his view, this funding uh, should come from the Treasury, and, and that is where it remains, to my knowledge, at the moment, uh, Chris, on this one. Would it be a standing convention that ultimately they they created this and now we're being expected to pay for it? Well, that's that's precisely the point, and in, 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 in that the funding policy dictates that, who, that 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 the administration that actually raises the the um, the policy uh, and, and and puts the policy through in law uh, is is the one that should identify the funding. That's where where the discussion is at the moment. Is that is that an accepted convention? Because there's other policies that the, uh, Julian Smith, uh, during his tenure, um, 
instituted, and I'm just trying to establish, is it accepted convention and practice that if Westminster legislates for something, they should pay for it? Well, that's certainly the view that, that, that the Prime Minister of the Department of Finance took uh, on this, uh, uh, Chris, so, um, and that's, that's, that's the best advice that I have. Okay. Um, in terms of, on page uh, 23 of the pack, Annex A, with regard to, excuse me, urban villages and the 2.3 million uh, CDL uh, non-ring fenced, uh, could you explain to me, does that imply that that money may not be spent on urban villages or that it may be moved elsewhere? Peter, do you want, do you want to just pick that one up? Yeah, it's the same principle as uh, I outlined in relation to Brexit. Um, the, the, the ring fencing terminology is one that is applied by DOF for particular funding streams to departments. Uh, for ourselves, the ring fenced funding stream uh, on the CDL side is in relation to delivering social change, uh, the line above the 7.8 million. That means we cannot move that money anywhere else within our spending area. If we do not uh, utilize that 7.8 million, we have to surrender it back to DOF. The non-ring fence is again, it just gives us the ability as a department to allocate the funding to whatever priorities we consider there, there to be. And in, in relation to this particular one, uh, there are uh, certain projects, I think that's a particular project, the Urban Villages one, which is underway subject to contractual commitments. So we will have to meet that 2.3 million cost because it's legally committed. The non-ring fence is just reflects the fact that we have we have allocated there out of our general allocation for CEDA. But there's an, uh, so I can be absolutely confident that that 2.3 million will be delivered in the Urban Villages programme? Yes, That's has to be, yeah. Okay, um, Pat Sheehan, you're online there. Do you have any questions? Sorry, I was just on muting there. Uh, um, Thanks very much. I've just one, just one short question. <laughs> you weren't muting me. <laughs> no, himself. Is that going go on ahead, Pat? You're getting paranoid. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's okay, Christopher. It was just me who was muted. Not your but it's an idea, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice thought, but we'll leave it for another. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Mark and Peter. Uh, it's just one a question in, in relation to the, the, the crisis that we're in at the minute and uh, I suppose the lockdown. Is there any anticipation that there'd be underspend in some of the budget lines as a result of this uh, COVID crisis? <coughs> I think that, that's something that we're looking at at the minute, Pat, because um, it, as you can understand, it's quite difficult for, it's, on, well, it's, it's pretty well impossible in most areas to deliver things as before. So uh, in a lot of our funding programmes, what groups are looking at is innovative ways uh, of trying to, to deliver their programmes using online as far as possible or some other type of um, approaches. Uh, and we are working with them to try and be flexible to, so that they can deliver their programmes in different ways. Uh, and if necessary, push back some of the face-to-face -face, uh, work till later in the year, depending, of course, on how all of this develops. Um, and we will be keeping a close eye on the funding. I think the reality is that there must be a possibility that in some areas that there could be underspend, um, and we'll, we'll need to keep an eye on that. Thanks for that. And just in terms of the potential underspend, if, if, the, if it's anticipated soon enough, can that then be reprofiled to go somewhere else? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, at the, at the first monitoring round, we can we, we can look and see if there's any evidence of emerging underspends, and if there are, is evidence within the department of emerging pressures that we can put that towards. And if not, uh, then we we would be surrendering it to the centre to meet any any uh, pressures across other departments. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, okay, uh, and maybe, gentlemen, just before uh, completing, uh, can I ask just supplementary to, to that? W w you obviously have your own funding that you 
give out to groups and organisations, but you also draw down funding from places like the European Union to hand out to groups that then use. Have you had any um, steer from the likes of European Union and other funding bodies that you draw down funds from that they are happy that you use innovative ways to work and that they're not looking to, to recall any of the budgets that they have given to you? Um, well, the indication that I have seen so far from SEUPB is that they are looking uh, at, with, at, or with groups at how to, to deliver things in a different way um, to try and meet the objectives and outcomes that are set for the various programs in a different way. So my understanding is that they are trying to exercise some flexibility and are working with groups uh, to actually uh, uh, to do that. And I think that's a fairly common uh, uh, approach um, across funding bodies. Certainly from our perspective, we're working hard with groups to, to allow them to do that. And we've had some very good uh, examples. We had a, a good example in the North Belfast Good, good Relations uh, Fund where um, one of the ways they took that forward was to have uh, Eamon Phoenix, the historian, do a, the historian do a virtual walking tour uh, around uh, North Belfast, and people were able to, to go online and to follow that, uh, and that helped uh, to, to deliver their program in a very innovative and very enjoyable way. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can I just uh, check? We're finished with people in the room, but um, Pat was the only one that was on with us on the telephone at the start of this. Is there anybody else on via the teleconferencing? Any other members? Uh, uh, George Robinson's here, uh, oh, Chair. Yes, George. We, do you have any questions? I have no like questions to... at the moment. I've just been listening on for the last hour or so, but I have, I have nothing. I have no pack in front of me, so oh, okay. I can't really take too, too big a part in, in the meeting, but uh, I'm here at Keeping an eye on on developments and and listen listen to the the, uh, the questions so so far. Okay, that's great. Is there any other members on there? I'm here as well. Emma Sheehan's here. I don't have anything that I want to ask. Okay, that's great. And Trevor, now you are indicating uh, there. Yep. Yeah, it's just to apologise, Chair. I've only just managed to conquer the technology here. I haven't had <laughs> it back in front of me. But I've been sitting here looking bewildered, so I'll, I'll make up for it next week. <laughs> That's okay. We're using a different well, format next week. No, okay. okay, well, um, Peter and Mark, that's us uh, finished with yourselves. Thank you very much for um, coming along via teleconference today to give us that input. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, members, so uh, what we will do is um, we will collate the information as discussed today and um, we will get a report for members for next week's meeting and what that will do is it will form the basis of what the contribution will be um, to the budget debate which is taking place the, on the 6th of May. Um, so obviously any of the remarks that members have made today, any of the questions that people have um, queried, um, we will prepare uh, Marie will prepare that report for next week. So if members are happy enough with that, we'll get that report. We can check what's in it and what's yeah. not in it at that stage. Uh, content, Chair, but I, I do want to emphasise it's clear that there is money, real money, for the victims of historical institutional abuse. Yeah. But there's nothing agreed for the troubles victims. Yeah. And, and that is in that letter as well at, at the end that, that's there or in the table. Um, pack today, but we, so we can discuss it at that stage as well, maybe as a sure. follow-up to that. Um, also, um, then just to seek agreement as well, the forward, there, sorry, I've went one paragraph ahead of myself. Um, there is a research paper that is presented in the um, table pack today, um, and there are a number of scrutiny points that, that are raised in that. Are we content for that to be forwarded to um, the department and I'm going to ask the clerk to update me on that one because I can't remember the, uh, the full ins and outs of that it's one. Just, just this Assembly Committee's coordinated budget scrutiny paper. Um, there are points for scrutiny in it, but a lot of them refer to the Department of Finance, Department of Health. There are some that refer to all departments and our departments. So it's just really to, if members are content to forward the research paper uh, to the department asking that it responds to the scrutiny points within its remit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, is that for just our committee, that research paper? Or that's that's going different. So they should have that already, but we'll just send it to them to make sure that they have it. Yeah. The, the executive yeah. office, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's grand. Thank you. Okay. Well, then, if you're happy enough, then we will move on then to um, item five, which is the statutory rule. Um, 2020 stroke 50, the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board Applications and Appeal Rule of Northern Ireland 2020. I think this is another one of these ones where I have to do a lot of reading today, so reading out, so my apologies in advance of that. It's on page 27 
uh, of the meeting pack. Um, just to remind you that on our meeting on the 25th uh, of March, uh, we agreed that it was content with the proposal for statutory rule which would set out the procedures to be followed by the HIA Redress Board. Um, so the statutory rule was laid on the 27th of March and it's subject to a negative resolution procedure. Um, there have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was considered by the committee. So I uh, can also advise you that the examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported her findings on the technical elements of the statutory rule. Um, but if you're content with it and subject to the ex uh, examiner of statutory rules report, um, then we could put the question. So are members content thus far? Yeah, obviously content. the questions content. have been raised, yeah. uh, but they've been really picked up on. Okay, well then in that case then um, I can put the question to the committee that the committee for the executive office has considered SR 2020-50, stroke the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board Applications and Appeals Rules Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed, but I just want to put in the caveat that um, as they have been outlined, that the victims are not experiencing, experiencing yeah. it in the same way. So we need to just pick up on those questions that I've raised and I can send them forward as well in written format if that's helping to be shared with the committee. Okay, then we can move on to item uh, six, which is a draft statutory resolution for the consent, the, sorry, the census order. Uh, Northern Ireland 2020, um, there's a departmental written briefing, um, members that's on page 56. So again, at our meeting on the 25th of March, we agreed that it was content with the proposal for the statutory rule at that stage, which will direct that a census should take part in 2021, and it outlined in broad terms the content and coverage of that census. Um, at the meeting on the 18th of March, the Committee for Finance agreed that it had no objections uh, to the proposal of the statutory rule. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can let members know that the draft statutory rule was laid on the 27th of March, that it is subject to a draft affirmative resolution procedure. There have been no changes, no changes to the policy content since that SL1 was considered by both committees. Now the examiner of statutory rule has not yet again reported on her findings on the technical elements. Um, but if we are content with the draft statutory rule, subject to those reports, we can make agreement to it. Everybody happy enough broadly? Do I don't know. <laughs> You're agreeing. We're agreeing uh, mm. Therefore, I can put the question that the Committee of the Executive Office considered draft statutory resolution in the Consensus Order Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report recommend that it be approved by the Assembly. So agreed? agreed? Yep. Okay. Um, then we move on to item seven. Uh, which is the statutory rule 2020 stroke 55, the health protection coronavirus restrict restrictions, regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, departmental written briefing. Um, it's on page 104 of the pack. Uh, maybe to advise members that the department has provided a written briefing in relation to the aspects and consequences of the regulation and certainly those elements which relate to the executive office. Now, as members will be aware, the regulations were laid under the emergency procedure and came into operation on the 28th of March. They were scrutinised um, by the Department uh, or the Committee for Health and they were debated yesterday in the Chamber uh, and were subsequently approved. Um, if members will uh, reflect just at my remarks earlier um, to the officials on, who were presenting earlier, I just, you know, I don't think there is any other way that this could have taken place. But just acknowledging to ensure that the department are aware that we're uncomfortable, that I'm uncomfortable with the fact that we have had to do things back the front. Uh, in other words, that they implement the rules, then they get the assembly approval, and then the presentation to the committee. So, um, you know, in the ideal way, that would be the other way around. But um, just in noting that, uh, are members happy to note the content of the briefing as presented? Yeah, chair, can I ask? Did, was there any attempt made? To ask the committee to meet early. Was there, sorry? Any attempt to ask the committee to meet before yesterday's assembly set? No. The, I suppose the regulations fall to the health for um, scrutiny. I actually had to ask for that briefing so that we would have something. I don't think that's good enough. I don't see why you couldn't have said. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. Could we meet on Monday or first thing Tuesday? 
I think what we could do, as suggested um, by Martina earlier, you know, write to the department, as was outlined in terms of the committee is open to meeting yeah. outside of its normal time, day, night, or whatever, to consider yeah. issues mm. that... I think Mike raises an important point. There is an issue as well around the ad hoc committee on coronavirus. It meets only when ministers indicate they wish to make a statement to it. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I'm uncomfortable with that. I suppose I'm speaking more as a <laughs> deputy speaker rather than as a DP MLA in that regard. But, and similarly with this, I mean, I was uncomfortable with the content of the stuff, but I'm especially uncomfortable that, you know, we're, we're being asked the day after. So no, I think Mike raises an important point because health may have scrutinized the stuff, but it's the executive office that has overall command, command of it. So no, we should have been consulted. I think that's right. Martina? Absolutely, I, sh I share that uh, that that view, and and that's why I sort of even come in mm. on the back of, of what you had said because you know these measures are utterly draconian, mm. and we all understand why they're necessary, and we all give expression to that uh, on the floor of the chamber, and if had it been in any other time, um, we would have been all speaking very loudly uh, against them, maybe, you know, and it's about our role in having to ensure they're proportionate. And under the European Convention even of Human Rights, where we have got an obligation on the right to, uh, to save lives. And then particularly when you look at the six, Section 75 obligations and when you talk about women, because most of the, the call that we've heard from domiciliary care workers are mainly women, not all women, and the, the issue of PPE. You know, yes, there were issues that related primarily to health, but in relation to equality, human rights, and the remit of this committee and what falls into our domain, we should have had an opportunity to scrutinise these before yesterday. And, um, and I think we should all just have our collective view of this um, relayed to, uh, to, the, to the committee, to the department, I mean. Uh, and to say that we're still like there's things like domestic violence we've all mentioned it that have mm. skyrocketed things that we are dealing with around human rights and equality and the protection of individuals so therefore it wasn't just that these measures only impacted on the remit of the scrutiny of the health yeah. committee and as you could mm. hear yesterday uh, all of us um, and it was our it was the OFM DFM it was the two junior ministers uh, who were presenting so we should have had an opportunity to scrutinise these Sure, can I suggest we actually were right to the department along the lines Martin has so. articulated? Can I just ask, is there anybody that's on the phone that wishes to comment? Uh, it's George Robinson here. I, yes. Um, Martin is speaking there. I just couldn't hear hardly a word that she said, so I can't comment, quite honestly. <laughs> I agree with everything. Okay. <laughs> I agree with it, George. <laughs> well, your, your colleague Christopher will ensure that, that, that was all, uh, it was all agreed. But I do think it, you know, we're certainly acknowledging that circumstance is going to result in somewhat of a democratic deficit, but I think we're getting an over, I'm getting a sense that we feel that that deficit is wider than it need be, yes. and that maybe we need to, to write to the department and certainly ask them for some sort of, um, some sort of update on what what consideration they give to ensuring that the committee receives the proper uh, consideration uh, that it needs to be given. So, yeah. um, to, to make we, clear, we are willing to be yeah, flexible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're prepared. And, and I mean, th th there's a, it's a long time from the, the 28th of March when those rules were, were brought in through to yesterday, them going to the Assembly. So, that, you know, there was, a, there was nearly a three-week gap there that we could have been asked for an opinion uh, yeah. at that stage. OK, um, members, we can move on then if we're, we're content to item 8, which is the forward work programme, which is obviously in somewhat um, of a disarray at the moment. Um, pages add on just so uh, Page 138 um, of the meeting pack. Um, in uh, my discussion as chair with the clerk to try and work a, a way forward um, with this um, and trying our best to embrace... Um, technology because I think initially we had taken the decision um, as a committee that if it was a matter of 
um, a change to the law or it was a matter of money that we would meet. But I suppose those initial reflections were taken when we were looking at the short term uh, in terms of the impact of social distancing and other impacts from coronavirus. But I think that we could take the view now that that short term is going to turn into the medium term, which will certainly take us up to the end of June. And then if we uh, if we do enter into a summer recess, and I'm, I'm sure many will suggest that with the lack of sittings, we may need to continue on over the summer. But at this moment in time, if we're looking at breaking for a recess at the end of June, you know, we're looking at the end, start of September and October before we can come back. And there's a, um, there is a list at the end of the forward work programme of a number of the briefings that have been parked. Um, thus far. So, for example, we were due to receive um, briefings from the Community Relations Council, the Victims and Service, the Equality Commission, and then we also had a number of uh, contributions lined up from the Research Department in terms of documents that were being presented on things that we had asked. Um, I think it's become increasingly clear that this teleconferencing facility in the first instance facilitates people ringing in and giving an oral presentation which we can then follow up with asking questions and if some of the members are happy um, to, to call in from their offices or from home and we have a maximum of four uh, members and myself here in the in the room and that could increase if we get the time slot available from the Senate Chamber and as we progress there may be other methods through Microsoft Teams and other programmes to do that. If members are agreeable to that, could we ask the clerk maybe to set up one or two um, briefings for us on the areas that are currently parked and have them presented in the meetings going forward? Yep. Would there be broad agreement to that? Yep. Mm -hmm. That was what was done yeah. at the... Yeah. That was what was done at the Economy Committee this morning and it worked quite well. So, okay. Sorry, not video link. Video no. didn't work well, but no. the conference call. Conferencing works, seems to work fine. Well, look, if members are happy to contend, we'll, we'll come back next week. Mm -hmm. with. Um, we're coming back next week anyway for other mm -hmm. uh, the EU briefing, but what we can do is we can have a, a schedule at that stage that will show us what we can do then in, in the weeks from that. Yep. Um, Okay, uh, then uh, we can move on then to item nine, which is Chairman's Business, which is none this week. And uh, but we do have quite a hefty correspondence um, section, which then takes us to item ten. So, members, there are eleven items of correspondence on page one hundred and forty-three to page two hundred and two of the meeting pack. I will draw members' attentions to um, item ten point one, which is on page one hundred and forty-three which is a response from the Department following our request for examples of cases involving regulations being made by Westminster to introduce a scheme to be administered by an executive department. Um, the Department has indicated its willingness to further update the Committee on engagement with institutions uh, regarding historical institutional abuse once discussions with Ministers are complete. So, um, if members are content, we could add an oral briefing on the issue uh, on that list of forward work programmes that's going to be prepared for next week. Would members be content? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, item 10.2, refer on page 145, uh, is a response from the Department following the briefing of the First and Deputy First Minister on the 5th of February. Um, it's quite a detailed paper and actually quite a good paper, which details the response. Uh, and the uh, requirements for the new decade, new approach document, which fall within uh, the remit of the executive. Um, so, the number, uh, a number of committees have also um, indicated that they would have an interest to find out what their various responsibilities would be. So, um, it's tabled there for ourselves, but also if members are happy, we can forward that to all other statutory uh, and standing mm -hmm. committees so that they can see what their responsibilities are. Yep. So um, two issues, number one, if members are happy for that to be forward, and number two, is there any questions that members have on that document? No. Okay. So then item 10.5, uh, which is on page 186, is a memo from the clerk of the Finance Committee regarding the in-year monitoring process and the revised arrangements that have been put in place to help manage uh, uncertainty as a result of the COVID-19. Um, the arrangements provide authority for departments to reallocate funding across spending areas over and above the normal 100, or sorry, 1 million limit without the need for further uh, executive approval. 
So in relation to the June monitoring round and beyond, is there agreement that details of any reallocation of funding within the Executive Office, which either relates to COVID-19 and or anything else, uh, should be forwarded to the Committee for Finance? Are we happy with that? Yep. Okay. Yep. Nearly getting there, getting there. Items 10.6 and 10.7 on page 190, 191. Again, correspondence from the Clerk of the Committee for Finance inviting the Committee to provide a written response to provisions contained within each clause of the Functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. And there's also a copy there of the letter to David Sterling, the Head of Sir Civil Service, inviting him to give oral evidence to the Committee for Finance on the Bill. So, um, basically, my understanding of this is that we had that um, long process of working out which committee should scrutinise the bill. Was it finance, was it executive office, or was it the stand? ARC. A ARC. ARC. Um, the decision was taken then that it was the finance committee that they would look at it. So what they're doing is they're um, looking to speak or to have oral evidence from the head of the civil service. Um, and they're asking us if we have any questions that we would like to ask of him as part of that briefing. No. I, wanna, I, I said in the, in the chair's briefing I was going to end up passing this one over because I got confused, but do you want to give us the, the run for this? Even though, as the chair has just outlined, the Committee for Finance has lead responsibility for taking the committee stage of the bill, because we're an interested committee, we would be expected to provide our views on the clauses that are relevant to TEO. Now, my understanding from speaking to the um, Committee for Finance, Clark, is they're going to concentrate on those areas that refer to special advisors and civil servants. For the TO, um, the areas that we should cover are ministers and special advisors within the, um, the executive office. So there is going to be some overlap, but we have to draw a line somewhere. Um, and I suggested that we right to um, the, the executive office along those lines, ask for a response. Normally you give three weeks for a response, which would leave at about the sort of 14th of May. We would consider it our meeting on the 21st of May. We would then decide, do we want to bring in um, Hawks in or do we want to bring somebody else in? So there's an issue with the 1st of June um, deadline. deadline. Like really to give a proper consideration, you're not going to meet the 1st of June deadline. So. Um, it's suggested you, know, you might want to, to, to write to ask for that evidence and also write to the Committee for mm -hmm. Finance. Just highlight at this stage that it's unlikely that the 1st of June deadline will be met, but you'll get a response get a as response soon as possible as well. thereafter. Yep. 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 Stay on. Yep. Okay, I couldn't have put it better myself. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I fulfilled self-fulfilling prophecy there. Um, yeah, okay then. So then, uh, in that case, then, uh, can we... we we will write to the Head of Civil Service and ask for that update for ourselves and also write to the Finance, Finance Committee yeah. saying that there uh, they're likely to be a delay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, if members are content then. Uh, item 11, is any other business? Any members, any other business? Then the only other element then is the date and time of the next meeting. At this stage in the papers it said 4 o'clock next Wednesday in the Senate, com Senate Committee Chamber. <coughs> However, we have received notification that a time slot has become available for 1 o'clock um, in the Senate mm -hmm. Chamber of next week. But it's 1 o'clock until 2.15. So it's just a time slot of 1 hour and 15. Are we happy to, to go for that slot? I, do, I know some okay. members are involved in other committees. That May I just come in there? Next week, you would be agreeing your response to the budget to go to the Committee for Finance for inclusion and in its report to the overall response. And you will also be having a briefing on Brexit and the work of the subgroup, the EU subgroup. So whether you Brexit, think... Brexit and the budget, sure, you could do that in around 15 minutes. <laughs> I yeah. Think yeah. That's yeah. going to work. Uh, because the thing is, you know, if, if you did move, you would have to leave because it, the place needs cleaned for yes. another committee to come in. So if you leave it until four o'clock, that's the last one. And if you run over by half an hour, that's okay. fine. Can, can the, I make the first yeah. element is, is a report that will be in the packs? I will be putting the report in the pack yeah. hopefully on Friday. So that might go through on the nod. So it's really just Brexit. Well, it'll be Brexit then, but you. Be but what 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 time is this room available? Because if if we had agreement, uh, um, and maybe the the, the right. people could do a ring round. If we had, 
four members that were happy to ring in. This yeah. setup, I think, has worked. So is this still available for two o'clock? I don't week? think it'll be available for two, but it may well be available for three. The issue is that um, how do you say to you know to members, no, don't you bother coming along. You just ring in. You yeah. know, so if you have seven, eight members. Okay. I think each party will work that out yeah. uh, so that we at least have one member present and, okay. and two phoning in. Well, if uh, you want... Pat, would that be... Yes, that, uh, that uh, sounds yeah. about right to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, we, we've we've certainly been doing it for the Health Committee for the last number of weeks, uh, even yeah. in the Senate Chamber. There's only four or five in the room and, and, yeah. and people yeah. ring okay. in. So no, we'll, we'll work that out. Okay. Well, I we have one. But this room then is available for three and confirm as soon as possible yeah. that it's... Yes. Okay. Stays the same. I, uh, can I take a read of the room as well? If it was a little bit earlier than three, like if it was two, I think we can. If, we, if, if, we if, can. if it is uh, the earlier in the yeah, day rather than the later, later in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Certainly. All right, members. Then in that case, we can adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You very much. Thank, Thank you. you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Thirty.